Hello, this is Tian. I am a senior research scientist at Tai Chi Graphics. Today we are going to go through a high-performance programming language guide with the Tai Chi programming language. Before joining Tai Chi Graphics, I got my PhD in computer graphics and spent three years as a researcher in Microsoft Research Asia. My research cares about high-performance computing, especially for simulating deformable objects in real time. So in this course, we are going to talk exactly about how to make our code faster. To be more specific, we will talk about the tricks we can play to optimize the data access in order to make our code faster. In this course, we will first explain why data access matter for high-performance computing and take a short recap of a Tai Chi programming language. Then we will dive into efficient data layouts and data structures for different applications and cover their usages in Tai Chi. At last, we will also mention quantized data types, not really for good performance, uh, but rather for saving the memory. Let's get started. The data matters. This is a basic architecture of modern computers, and yes, it has been used for almost a century, and we are still using that. Now let's rule out the input and output devices and focus on the computing part in the middle. The processing unit takes instructions and data as input and gives the computed result as output. But the number of registers inside CPUs is very limited, so the processing unit needs to constantly ask for new data and saves the result back to a bigger pool of data, which is the physical memory, as in the bottom. Apparently, at this level of, of ab abstraction, we can see fast CPU plus fast data access equals to good performance. Great. This is also how I was taught when I was an undergrad. And most of my effort towards high performance application was spent on, on clever algorithms to reduce the time complexity in order to save some CPU cycles. However, in a real computer, the processor runs much, much faster than memory. For example, in this Intel Skylake architecture, the main memory provides data at around 36 gigabytes per second. Every time our CPU asks for some data, it needs to wait for around 256 cycles as latency. That's pretty bad. And the recent development of hardware does not fill the gap between the main memory and the processor, but make it even worse. So how are we going to do about it? In fact, the data transfer between the processors and the memory is not as simple uh, as we just described. The data is actually served in a hierarchy. The key idea is to build levels of memory that people call caches. The caches closer to the processor are faster but also smaller. Whenever the processor wants some data, it first looks for data in the L1 cache. If not found, it will then look for it in L2 and etc. etc. until it reaches the main memory. Oh, by the way, uh, we are not going to talk about the virtual memory and the physical memory today, so we can ignore the page table and the translation lookup side buffer, which is essentially the cache for page, ta for page table. Um, so let's feel how important um, our cache is um, in, in an actual chip. This is an Intel i7 die, which contains four physical CPU cores. And each core looks like this. And we can see nearly half of the core are designed for caches, including the uh, L1 caches for data and instruction and the L2 cache. So your CPU core now um, is not all about processing instructions and computing. It also stores your data inside as well. Still, in this Skylake architecture example, the caches can store kilos to millions of bytes of data um, and the data retrieving time in cache is order of magnitude faster compared to the main memory. As we said before, caches are not drawn to scale. Access of lower memory is invoked by faster memory cache misses. Another property of the cache 
is that it does not cache our data one byte at a time. Well, before we explain this property, let's, let's take a look at the strangely behaved C++ algorithm. This program first allocates a big chunk of memory to an array A, um, and then assigns some of the array elements with certain values. The number of assigned elements are controlled by the parameter stride. Larger stride tells the program to skip more elements. However, when we change the stride parameter from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16, um, the runtime does not reduce. Even the number of elements we assigned get smaller. Why? That's because the bottleneck of this program is not at the computing part where we multiply i by 2. That's almost nothing, right? But really at the store instruction where we need to write the value of ai back to the memory. And every time we access some data, the hardware sends not only the data into cache, but its neighbors, but its contiguous data next to it as a unit. We call that unit a cache line. For example, on uh, this computer, the size of cache line is 64 bytes, which is uh, 16 integers. Every time we fail to find AI cached, the hardware will send AI along with its 15 neighbors um, from AI to AI plus 1 to until AI plus 15 into the cache. So the next visit of AI plus 1 or AI plus 2 plus 3, um, they are almost for free. As the stride increases, the actual main memory visit is not decreased until the stride size gets to 32 or even larger. So what do we learn here? Well, first, memory is usually much slower than processors. Although we used the Intel CPU architecture to illustrate this, but that applies to your GPUs as well. In fact, the slow memory problem can be even worse for GPUs. And second, caches are our friends. They are our best friends in high-performance computing. They are designed to mitigate the slow memory problem. To make our program faster, we want to improve the cache hit rate and make use of the prefetched cache lines. It sounds simple, right? <laughs> but how can we control the memory layouts and memory access patterns to utilize the caches? That's the major part we are going to cover in this course. Since we also use the Tai Chi programming language to showcase the examples, let's first take a quick recap of Tai Chi. Okay, so what is Tai Chi? Tai Chi was a domain-specific language introduced by Yuan Minghu and colleagues at SIGGRAPH Asia 2019. Yuan also gave a SIGGRAPH course about the basics of Tai Chi at SIGGRAPH 2020. In the following 10 minutes, we will really fast forward that course to get everybody in the same page. Tai Chi serves many SIGGRAPH researchers, um, such as the AS flip paper last year, and the SEC-free initialization, and uh, automatic quantization projects this year. Tai Chi has a Python front end, which is pretty simple to install and to use that maximizes the productivity of using this language. It is optimized for parallel computing. Most of the Tai Chi programs are comparably fast compared with corresponding fine-tuned CUDA programs. The Tai Chi programs can be deployed uh, with multiple backends to different devices on different GPUs and CPUs. And Tai Chi was, is, and will always be open sourced. Um, the development of Tai Chi thrives through the open source community, and we will keep doing that. The installation of Tai Chi is as simple as other Python packages. We can just pip install it. The current version of Tai Chi is 1.2.0, and we keep updating it in about every two weeks. After the installation, uh, we can use TI to start Tai Chi's command line interface. If you are the first time user, um, it is highly recommended to run TI Gallery to see all our featured examples or to run TI Example to see all the provided official examples. Let me open my shell to see if you can see it. Let me make it bigger. Um, 
if I run TI Gallery, it will actually pop up a window with uh, several pictures over there. Um, it consists of some fractal program and some simulation program and rendering program. If I click fractal.py, it will show the code for the fractal and pop up a, a GUI to see the result of that project. All right. So as, our, our, as we already see, uh, there's a fractal.py. Let's try to see how this Tai Chi program um, look like, perform. This is the Julia set program where every pixel keeps updated itself using z equals to z squared plus c, where z is a complex number whose real and imaginary part are bounded from negative one to one, and c is a time-varying variable controlled by a cosine signal. The program visualizes how fast the transformation of z equals to z squared plus c diverges. The slower it diverges, the darker it will be. At the very beginning of this program, we first import Tai Chi as Tai. This is very much the same with the usage of PyTorch or TensorFlow or any Python packages you use. In the second line, ti.init, this line invokes the Tai Chi compiler. Here we set the architecture to ti.gpu, uh, so the Tai Chi compiler will actually look for the availability of CUDA or Vulkan or OpenGL or Metal backends. If none of them are found, um, it will fall back to a CPU solution. Once we initialize the Tai Chi program, we first allocate a 2M by N array as a ti.field. This Tai Chi field um, is essentially an n-dimensional array. It's like the ND array in NumPy or a tensor in PyTorch. And we use this array as pixels to represent the pixels on the screen. Field, that's a, um, that's a concept we, you're probably not familiar with. Field is the most useful data container in Tai Chi. It represents a multi-dimensional array of elements. For example, um, if you do cook in your kitchen, um, you can find your pan, probably a square pan, uh, 256 by 256 field, and uh, um, each element on that pan can represent the heat or the temperature over there. So here we can define a heat field as a scalar array in this 200 by 256 by 256 square space. There are some properties of a field. Fields, they are global. Um, they can be read and written anywhere. And the fields are n-dimensional. The most commonly seen fields are either like there are one or two or three dimensionals, but it can be higher dimensional without any problem. The elements inside a field can be scalars, vectors, matrices, or their mixed structures. As we can access the elements inside a field using IJK indexing, um, like here, we assign the element in row one and column two of pixels 242, and here, um, we can set the very first element of VF to a new vector 1, 2, 3. If the dimension of a field is 0, we can also access its element using the keyword non. For example, this 0d scalar non equals to 1, or this 0d vector non um, equals to uh, a vector, uh, which has two elements, 2 and 2.5. Let's take a look at uh, some quantities we can define using field. For instance, we can define a 3D force field in a room as a 3D field full, filled with 3 by 1 vectors. We can also define a string tensor field as a 2D field with 2 by 2 matrices or um, 2 by 2 tensors, if you like to call. We can also define a global variable with a 0D field. This is basically a scalar that we can access with non. Now we have our data defined using fields. Let's take a look at the computations in Tai Chi. The functions decorated with ti.kernel and ti.func, they are Tai Chi functions and they will be processed with a Tai Chi compiler, but not the Python interpreter. 
The ti.kernels can be called anywhere from Python, and ti.funks can only be called from a ti.kernel. So if you're familiar with CUDA, you can think of ti.kernel as a global function and ti.funk as a device function. The good thing about those Tai Chi functions is that the outermost for loop inside a ti.kernel is automatically parallelized. For example, in this case, the 4i in range 10 and 4k in range 20 at the bottom, and they are both uh, outermost for loops, so they will be executed in parallel. Uh, this nested for loop, this j4j in range 5, um, because this one is not the outermost for loop, and that one will be executed sequentially. Note that the outermost condition also includes the branching statement. If the for loop is inside a branching statement like, like uh, this one in the bottom, um, it will be serial as well. Tai Chi support three types of parallel for loops. And here I will first mention two of them. The first one is range four. Uh, that's pretty much identical to the Python range four for, for like a 4i in range 10 or 4j in range 100, et cetera, et cetera. The second one we call it struct four. You can loop over a field using something like 4ijk in a field. And uh, this is a pretty much, uh, this is a pretty convenient especially for multi-dimensional fields. And both i and j indices will be executed in parallel. Since Tai Chi supports parallel for loops, the automatic operations are also a must to ensure the correctness of, their, of your programs. The compiler will automatically demote some of the, automatic, some of the auto, atomic operations if found unnecessary. But you can always use something like a plus equals to or atomic add, atomic minus uh, to ensure your atomic operations are done correctly. Last but not least, uh, Tai Chi also provides a very simple GUI system for you to visualize the results. Now we are done explaining the fractal.py example as a starter. Um, if you are looking for a physically based simulation as an entree, uh, you probably want to check the TI example NPM 128 as an implementation of the moving least square material point method paper in SQL 2018. And the implementation is written with 128 lines of code. To summarize this section, Tai Chi is a DSL for graphics and parallel computing. The most useful data container in Tai Chi is called ti.field, which is a multi-dimensional array. The functions decorated with ti.kernel or ti.func are taken care of by the Tai Chi compiler, and the outermost for loop in a ti.kernel is automatically parallelized. Okay, now getting back to this course, all right, um, playing with your data. First, let's go through a simple topic, data layouts for dense arrays. If you still remember the memory hierarchy, the key of memory-friendly programs is to keep the data always in cache. So let's keep the cache line model in our mind as well. <clears throat> this program initializes the elements in an array with their indices. We use gray to represent the data in global memory. We also use orange to represent cached data and use blue to represent the accessed data. For simplicity, here we assume the cache line is only 16 bytes or four integers because I don't really want to draw too many blocks. Um, once the very first element is visited, the second, third, and the fourth elements are prefetched to the cache because they are in the same cache line. So accessing those elements are almost for free. And we can keep going to access the rest of the array. As we can see, although this program visits 16 elements, it only has four collapsed global memory access. It is very good. The reason behind this efficient memory access pattern is actually because the data access order aligns with the data storage order in memory. 
but that only works for this 1D array, right? It is, unfortunately, usually not the case in multidimensional arrays. <clears throat> for example, this program does a very similar thing. It initializes the elements in a 2D array with some values. But the problem is that the memory addresses are assigned in 1D, and we need to flatten the indices of the two-dimensional array to store its element in 2D memory. If you still remember that we want to align the memory order with the access order to maximize cache utilization, we shall unroll this 2D array by row major if we want to access it in rows, like horizontally. If and we shall unroll it by column major if we want to access it in columns, like this one, in vertical way. Things can be more complicated. Sometimes we want to visit data in Z order to keep everything local. At this point, a better way to unroll this 2D array should be something like a hierarchical order. Since the access order really depends on the program, there is no one can be the best thing forever. We shall change the memory layout to optimize data access case by case. <clears throat> if I were told to write a C program to optimize memory access, I would probably write something like this. Here both X and Y are 3 by 2 arrays. The only difference is that X is row major, but Y is column major. When visiting the elements inside an XY, I want to visit always inner indices first for each array so that the two nested for loops here are flipped in this case. Since I am a terrible programmer, it is almost guaranteed that there will be some bugs if I write dozens of functions like this. Well, stack overflow, right? But the thing is our life could be much easier because we can use an advanced feature in Tai Chi to play with the memory layout elegantly. So let's upgrade, upgrade our ti.field to something fancier. Previously, we are using shape to define the dimensions of our Tai Chi field. Now, let's break the definition of the field into two lines of code. The first line declares that x is a field with 3 by 1 vectors, it's a vector field, but with an unknown shape. And the second line defines not only the size of the field, but its layout as well. Let's explain these two lines of code in English. The cell of root is a cell containing all Tai Chi field. It is in a chunk of memory um, that the Tai Chi compiler pre-allocates and manages. The root cell has a dense container with 16 cells along the ti.i axis which is the row axis, saying this container has 16 rows. Each cell of the dense container has a field X. This is to say, each cell in a row contains a 3 by 1 vector because X is declared as a field with 3 by 1 vectors. Here are some more examples of the advanced Tai Chi field. The fields defined using shape are shown on the left, um, and uh, those fields are exactly the same with the ones defined using ti.root, as shown on the right. ti.root, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's a root of what? Well, the Tai Chi field are always implemented as trees, actually, and the root in a, is the common root node for all those Tai Chi fields. We call each node of the tree a structural node, or simply node, and every Tai Chi field is a snow tree. The leaves of snow tree describe the cell data. The branches of the tree describe the sizes and memory layout for each field, and the root of the tree is the single root, which is managed by the Tai Chi compiler. Once we accept this node tree concept for each Tai Chi field, we can start to play with the memory layout using the trees. For example, a default 4x4 four four row major field can be placed using two levels of dense nodes. In the first level, we place a dense node 
with four cells in ti.i direction to the root, which is the vertical direction, four rows. And uh, in the second level, we place another dense node with four cells in ti.j direction. Um, and those nodes are, append on, are appended to, the, to each of the first level cells. And at last, we place a field as the leaves of the second level cells to finish the field definition. So now you probably already know how to define a column major field in Tai Chi, right? Let's recall that X and Y um, as three by two arrays. One is row major and one is column major. Here in Tai Chi, because X is a row major array, so that we shall first append a node with three rows to the root, and then append two columns to each row, and finally place X to it, as shown on the left. And then similarly, Y is a column major array, so we shall first append a node with two columns along the J axis, the horizontal axis, to the root, and then append three rows to each column, and finally place Y to it shown on the right. The definition of those arrays um, look way more complicated than the C code I wrote before, right? Um, so what was the point of doing things so complicated? The point is, the point is that the axis of those row or column based arrays are pretty simple in Tai Chi. We can use the struct for loop to loop over all those arrays in parallel. And even better, we do not need to change the computation code for different memory layouts. The Tai Chi compiler will auto automatically determine the outer and inner loop for different layouts automatically. For example, if you're looking at those two programs, the only two different between the only difference between those two programs is the definition of those two fields. On the left hand side, X is a row major field, and on the right hand side, um, X is a column major field, all right? The rest of the code are the same. And uh, um, this 4ij in X function, although they look the same, but it will loop in different orders. On the left, it will loop over rows first, and on the left, um, sorry, on the right, it will loop over columns first. Okay. So the decouple of data and computation in Tai Chi saves lots of effort, at least for me, um, to perform to to do the programming, and uh, it allows me to change data layouts even after the computational code are written to exploit data locality. Now we know how to use the dense nodes with ti.i or ti.j to rearrange an array from row major to column major. What does it mean if we append a row major node to the cells of another row major node, like this one? All right, as we can see, we append a dense row major node, which has four cells, to another one. What's this? This is a hierarchical data layout for a 1D array. So this hierarchical layout of this array emphasizes the data locality, the bottom level node. Like the ones over here, and they are always forced to group together. So although we access this array like a 1D field, we can access x1, x2, to like an x15, x14, but this array are actually stored like a 2D field. They are stored in blocks. This hierarchical layout enables us to construct a better data structure for the order access. In this example, we first append a 2 by 2 row major node to the root, which is uh, the square. Then append another 2 by 2 row major node to each cell of the first node, like those four smaller squares. Um, the resulted data structure will be stored in blocks, which aligns with the Z order access pattern. Again, since Tai Chi decouples its data and computation, Changing an array from a flat layout to a hierarchical layout does not change code to visit the array. The compiler will take care of this for us, like this one. Um, the, left, the left one, the is a row major flat layout, 
and the right one, Z, is a block major uh, hierarchical layout or Z order hierarchical layout. But visiting those two fields are exactly the same. The compiler will decide to which to visit which element first. <clears throat> To test the effect of the hierarchical layout, we can look for a stable fluid simulation example inside our official examples. The bottleneck of this program is usually at the projection step. A common treatment is to design a matrix-free Jacobi solver or a matrix-free conjugate gradient solver to solve this linear Poisson problem. And in this case, frequent two-dimensional neighbor axes are occurred, um, but, na but neither row major nor column major representation of the pressure field can help. We encourage you to try a hierarchical layout to see how it affects the performance to better access the neighbors for each grid. Another very interesting thing about layout is the switch between an uh, array of structures or structures of arrays. Which one's better? Well, um, again, this is hard to tell because that really depends on how we access those structures. All right. If we want to access a structure um, using x0 first, x1 next, we probably want to use an SOA to uh, connect all the elements inside the x first and connect all the elements in the y um, next to it. And But if we want to access those two arrays uh, using something like um, um, AOS.x, AOS.y first, then the array of structure might be a better solution. The default definition in Tai Chi um, is structure of arrays, where the elements inside each field are grouped together, like this one. But we can play this note trick again to weave the data in an AOS fashion by simply placing two fields together, like this one. If we can place x and y, then the elements inside an x, y will be placed in an interleaved way. Similarly, switching between AOS and SOA in Tai Chi only requires us to change the code at data definition, but not the computation. In this embodied simulation example, uh, we may notice that the symplectic Euler integration step updates the velocity of each particle using its force and update the position of each particle using this velocity. So maybe putting force, velocity, and position fields together in an AOS fashion may help. Well, um, who knows? But at least we can try, all right? We can change the data definition step of this, this program to AOS to quickly test this assumption and keep the more performant data layout to, to be the final version. That is a wild upgrade from normal Tai Chi field to snow trees, all right? Um, due to the data orientation design of Tai Chi, any change of data layouts does not need us to change their corresponding computing part. So any tips of using those advanced data layouts? None. There's no tips. We can always access our advanced data layouts using struct force as if they were our old friend TI.field defined with shape. To summarize on this section, we want to keep in mind that the memory order and access order are always preferred to be the same. We need to maximize the uh, usage of the cache lines. And uh, the Tai Chi field and the snow are, are actually snow trees. Um, those snow trees provide the flexibility to change the memory layout. We can um, append a dense node to the cells of another dense node to switch between row major and column major, um, to switch between flat and the hierarchical layouts, or to switch between SOA or AOS fashions. While those switches um, do not need us to change the computation code at all, the Tai Chi struct 4 will handle it for us automatically. Okay, so now we know how to play the data layouts for dense arrays, but how about the sparse ones? Hmm, sparse computing. Everyone's talking about it nowadays, but why do we need it? Well, taking a material point method simulation as an example, the simulation takes 256 by 256 grid cells in total, uh, which is subdivided into 16 by 16 blocks. 
and each block has 16 by 16 grid cells. So allocating the memory for the total 256 by 256 grid cells is a waste um, because some of the grids are filled with zero anyway. Those colored with dark green ones, uh, those grids are filled with zero all the time. So we don't even want to um, allocate the space for that. So can we save some memory space for these all zero cells and uh, even better to skip the computation for them as well? The answer is for sure yes. We can use Snow Tree for this purpose as well. Previously, we just talked about the dense snow tree, um, and we can append some sparse nodes, such as the pointers or bit masked nodes, uh, to the trees as well. Let's start with the dense node tree as an example. At first, we initialize a 3x3 three three, uh, row major field like this one, okay? And fill it with a single non zero element by setting x00 equals to 1. So after the assignment, uh, we will have x00 equals to 1 and the rest of the field equals to 0. Apparently, this is a huge waste because the majority of the space is empty, but we still allocated 9 integer space for this field. Since this is already a tree, so instead of placing a contiguous 36 byte space for the entire field, we can also change the first level of node to pointers, like this blue one. So what's the point of this pointer? Because in that case, we only need to allocate three integers underneath that pointer and a 40 a 64-bit pointer itself. Uh, so in total, it has uh, 20 bytes. From 36 to 20, we saved uh, 16 bytes here by just replacing a dense node to a pointers node. So now the Tai Chi program looks like this one. And the only difference is that the only difference is that we replace the dense node on the first level in the first first level block um, from the dense one to a pointer. Being different with the dense Tai Chi field whose memory are um, always pre-allocated. The sparse node trees are born empty. Every cell inside this node tree, uh, they are initialized as inactivate. Once we write an inactive cell, it will first activate the top level pointers node, the blue one, and activate the bottom level dense nodes as well. So it will um, activate all the way down to the leaf. Oh, one very interesting thing is it not only activate x uh, 0 but also activate x01 and x02 together because they belong to the same node. When looping over a sparse field, the compiler will only go over the activated cells and ignore the rest. So if we want to print xij uh, for every ij in x, um, it will only print one zero zero for us, and the rest of the field are actually ignored from the compiler. Well, and manually reading uh, inactive cells is also allowed. Um, it will not throw us a segmentation fault, but actually return us a zero instead. You may notice that once we write x00, um, we not only activate itself, but also activate its neighbors because they are in the same dense block. But we can also be even more frugal and uh, use two levels of pointers node to prevent extra, um, extra activations. This should work. Sorry, this will work. But uh, this is not always the best design idea because first of all, the Tai Chi I32 Tai Chi integer takes only 4 bytes, but uh, a Tai Chi pointer always takes 8 bytes because it runs in um, 64 bits. So replacing 3 integers with a pointer, uh, it will only save a third of the space. And more importantly, those dense blocks are faster to visit if you still remember the cache line model. If we really, really want to mask out those unused leaf cells, we can use bit masked node to do it. Each cell of the bit masked node has its own activation flag, so that the struct for loops will also automatically skip the empty bit masked cells. In this example, even if we enumerate 
on all ij's in x, uh, whenever you want to print xij, it will only print um, a single one but ignore all those zeros because all those gray bit mask cells are inactivated. Compared to the dense node, the bit maskless node does not save any space actual. Um, and on the contrary, it costs one bit extra for each cell. However, it can help to skip some for loops, so it's still worth trying in some applications. Since we can nest sparse blocks with other sparse blocks <laughs> using pointers node, so checking status, computing the indices of ancestors, or uh, menu activating, deactivating can be slightly more complicated. So you may want to check the APIs from the dark side of Tai Chi. You can also find the link of the course note on Instagram Asia 2022. So this is the dark side of Tai Chi. As we can see, it will list all the uh, related APIs about uh, the uh, uh, sparse nodes. OK. So let's put everything together. Um, now everything in a Tai Chi field um, can be represented using snodes. We can create a sparse field with the ability of managing data layouts as well, combined with the knowledge we just learned 10 minutes ago. Here um, is an example of column measured on two by four sparse field, because uh, the, um, at first we append a pointer, which, uh, which is uh, in direction ti.j, uh, it forms a row, it's a horizontal direction. And then uh, and in each cell, we append another dense block for in the, in the ti.i direction to it. And here, this one is a hierarchical field, all right? Uh, it is a nine by one sparse field. The first one, the first the block is, sp is sparse, and uh, the second one is bit masked. So the leaf cells are bit masked. And I, I can also construct something crazy uh, just because I could. So here, um, X is a column major, the two by three, 2D sparse field, uh, and uh, Y and Z are hierarchical sparse, four by one, one D sparse field. And uh, also Y and Z share the same sparsity pattern on P2. You may want to check the official example, Tai Chi sparse.py, uh, to see a rolling Tai Chi example where this uh, 512 by 512 grid is subdivided into four layers of blocks. And the first three layers are all constructed using pointers nodes. And each cell is dynamically activated and deactivated according to the rolling Tai Chi picture. To summarize, to summarize this section, we introduced the two different types of nodes to our snow tree to represent sparse cells, pointer and bit masked. We can simply activate a cell and its ancestor pointer by writing a value to it. We don't even need to initialize everything because uh, the sparse grid uh, is initialized as uh, inactive. Reading an inactive cell returns us a zero. It will not throw us an error, but return the uh, um, a zero value as expected. And last but not least, we can still loop for sparse fields using struct force as if they were dense. The compiler will skip all the inactive cells for us. The snow system was one of the main contribution of the original Tai Chi paper in SIGGRAPH Asia 2019. Um, you can check some more demos at the Tai Chi Elements repo if you are interested in it. Okay, so both the dense and the sparse nodes are designed for efficient memory accesses. We know it, all right? But uh, those are limited in structured grid, where the neighbor accesses are pretty simple. They're as simple as IJK plus minus one. And how about mesh-based data access? So first, what's the difference between mesh and a grid? Well, typically, we use the word mesh to represent unstructured grid, where the relations are represented explicitly. Here, this is a surface model of a bunny. We can see that it not only defines the position of each vertex here, but also defines the triangle vertex relation. Each triangle consists of three vertices with certain indices. For example, 
uh, this triangle in line 2509, um, it is consists of three vertices. The first vertex is 4, 2, 1. The second vertex is um, um, 1176. And the third vertex is 238. All right. And those mesh-based operations, they are often slow due to this unstructured memory access patterns. Let's take a look at, um, at a vertex normal computing program as an example. This program first loops over all faces and retrieves the indices for each face by looking up an FV relation table. For example, it noticed that uh, for uh, phase 6, um, it is constructed by three vertices, V3, V5, and V1. And then it will load the position attributes from the position array. It will tell us to uh, load for V1, 3, and 5. Once the positions are loaded, it computes the surface normal of that triangle using some, say, cross products. And finally, it writes the computed surface normal back to another attribute array for vertex normals. Since the storage of mesh attributes are very not likely to be in order, the mesh-based operations can be mostly out-of-cache operations, whose bottleneck is memory access. Again, memory. Let's still look at this surface normal example and the focus now on its data flow. So getting neighbor indices and loading data attributes often require out-of-cache global memory accesses. And writing the writing steps uh, make it even worse due to data races. Uh, the patch-based mesh representation uh, may come to the rescue. It subdivides the mesh into comparably sized patches, and uh, this presentation enables us to think of better data localization schemes and better parallelization strategies. It has been widely used in uh, uh, rendering in NVIDIA Turing Mesh Data and uh, in geometry processing applications uh, in Rx Mesh. So we provide an, a new way to perform mesh-based operations in Tai Chi. We call it Mesh Tai Chi. This Mesh Tai Chi compiler computes the neighbor indices in advance in the uh, compile time and utilizes on-chip memory to accelerate the attribute access. The compiler takes over the attribute data exchange between global and the shared memory to ensure that most attributes are already cached before they are needed for computations. It also reduces data races because data are written back to global memory only in batches. We can instantiate uh, a mesh with an external file. It can be an OBJ, it could be in a mesh. Um, and we might also want to tell the compiler about wanted relations here on CV. Here we set the cell vertex, like CV, um, as a wanted relation. because and. Uh, um, and of course, we can mark multiple relations as well. The compiler will prepare the lookup table for each relation during compilation. Once the mesh is loaded, we can define the attributes for each mesh element. Here we assign three 3x1 three factors as position, velocity, and force for each vertex, and assign a 3x3 three three rest post shape matrix and a scalar as the rest post volume for each tetrahedron cell. If you still remember uh, that we mentioned that uh, Tai Chi support three types of for loops, all right, but we only mentioned two previously. Now, um, here's the third one, mesh for loop. The mesh for loop is designed for enumerating mesh elements, such as 4C in cells in a bunny or 4V um, in vertices in a bunny. And those mesh for loops are also executed in parallel for each patch. Tai Chi also allows us to query relations using reference style. So we do not need to look up the relation table manually. We do not need to remember like uh, uh, vertex one, two, three are connected to four. Um, you, uh, the only thing we, we, we need to do is to um, query, for example, the three neighbors of vertex four and Tai Chi will automatically look the vertex one, two, three for you. The compiler also caches the wanted attributes implicitly so that the read and write for mesh attributes are accelerated. 
Here, the uh, position, the B matrix, the uh, W and the forces are very likely um, to get prepared in cache SR rally. So the uh, Tai Chi compiler will try to satisfy the lowest occupancy constraint first to determine the max number of size, sorry, the max size of cached attributes. And it will cache the stored attributes first because um, um, they are very likely to have some race conditions and order the rest of the attributes by their load frequency. Putting everything together, so the automatic parallelization and optimize the relation and attribute access makes the mesh-based operation blazing fast in Tai Chi. Here's an example of a mesh grid hybrid simulation based on material point method. The scene contains 0.2 billion vertices and 0.7 billion tetrahedra. The simulation takes 2.4 minutes to produce 300 sub-steps for each frame, and uh, the uh, Tai Chi mesh kernels runs more than twice faster compared to other compilers. As we mentioned before, um, it is always preferred to align the memory order with the access order, right? So what's the access order and in meshes? Since the mesh-based operations in Tai Chi are automatically parallelized in patches, um, it also provides a reorder keyword that enables us to play with the memory ordering. So we can simply set a reorder equals to true um, to force some attributes to be aligned uh, according to their patch IDs. So here we can reorder some of the elements, sorry, some of the attributes like the velocity and the force of the vertices um, to, to the patches. And we, all, we can also reorder the uh, uh, shape matrix and uh, the rest post volume of the cell uh, to be true. Like other data-oriented design in Tai Chi, uh, changing memory order for mesh attributes does not need us to change any of the computation. So accessing the reordered, uh, a reordered mesh is exactly the same of accessing a normal mesh. And in that way, Tai Chi enables us to uh, simulate, for example, this projective dynamic simulation on, on a mesh with 0.7 million elements in real time. It has 30 Sorry, it has five PD iterations per frame. It has uh, 30 CG iterations per linear soft, per global soft in PD. To summarize this session, mesh-based operations are often complex and uh, slow because usually a uh, user needs to manage those relations. For example, which edge is connected to which vertex, which vertex is connected to which surface, and they need to manage all those relations manually. And those mesh access is far less coherent compared to grid data. But the mesh touch module provides reference style access for mesh relations. And it also parallelizes the execution for each patch inside a mesh and optimizes the data access for mesh based operations. We had a paper about this, about this uh, new mesh touch module in Tai Chi, um, also here in SIGGRAPH Asia 2022. Please come to our technical paper pre presentation to see more details about the compiler design um, if you are interested in meshes and DSLs. We also provide a GitHub repo. We call it Mesh Tai Chi. It has all examples we showed, like the MPM one and the projective dynamic simulation one. Um, as you can see, if you search for Mesh Tai Chi on GitHub, you should be able to get to this page. Um, it also has a XPBD simulation and some um, finite element simulation as well. Okay, so now we have plenty of things in our mind to optimize data access. Well, the key is always to align the memory order with the access patterns to maximize uh, cache utilization, right? Keep this in mind, and uh, uh, we can play with some extra compiler hints to make our program run even faster. Although the Tai Chi compiler already puts many aggressive optimization strategies for data optimization, it is still hard for compiler to see the full picture of our programs. So sometimes we want to control the block size or we want to tell the compiler which data is more important manually. So before diving into those concepts, let's briefly go through the thread hierarchy in GPU for Tai Chi. 
The very basic element in a parallel program is called an iteration. One iteration represents the time we visit one element in an array or、uh, one element in a mesh. For example, if we call i,、uh, if we call for like、uh, i in range ten,、uh, then each of i equals to one or two or three is one iteration. And a thread, a thread is、uh, colored in blue. It contains several iterations, and a thread is the minimal parallelizable unit. All iterations inside a thread are executed in serial. A block. As colored in green and contains many threads, this is an important concept because different threads within the same block share a common block's local storage or BLS. And at last, a grid, which is a minimal unit、uh, that being launched from the host, as colored in gray here. And in Tai Chi, each parallel four is one grid, no matter if it's a range four or a mesh four or a struct four. Tai Chi implements its BLS using shared memory,、uh, so different threads within a block can communicate their data using BLS efficiently. So, what's the best size for each block? That really depends on the program, right? Again, for for example, when accessing this 128 by 128 hierarchical sparse field, we might want each block to at least cover the bottom dense node whose size is 64 bits. Sorry, 64 bytes. And、uh, the the default block size in Tai Chi is 256 bytes. But we can、um, decorate any parallel for loop in a Tai Chi kernel using the compiler hint ti dot blocked in. It will change the block size、um, for that for loop to a specific value. For instance, say、uh, 128 bytes, as shown in the second line, second for loop. For the most of the time, in order to achieve the best performance, we may want to perform a block dim scan ranging from like 32 bytes to 4K bytes and pick the best block size. But sometimes the compiler can do a more clever job if extra information were told. For example, if we know that a field A is the most important、uh, data inside a for loop, we can tell the for loop to cache the field. A manually and compute the most suited block size on its own. Each loop iteration access items with an offset, ninety-one、um, that row and that、uh, row two to its coordinates because、uh, we are accessing i minus one j and i j plus two. So therefore, the compiler will pre-allocate a shared memory、um, buffer of size five by six, like this one. On、uh, and pre-allocate A's data into buffer by this five by six, 120 bytes, and replace all the accesses to A、uh, in global memory with the buffer in the loop body. From a user's pr perspective, we don't even need to know this because uh, um, the only thing we need to do is to prepend a decorator, this、uh, block local decorator, to the wanted for loop. And similarly, we can also prioritize any wanted mesh attributes using another compiler hint, mesh local, in contrast of、uh, um, block local. The mesh local tells a mesh for to pre-allocate certain mesh data into the on-chip memory, and any load and store of those attributes are done locally. And the compiler will write that field back to main memory if any modification has been made. In this example. We set the position and the force of the vertices in the bunny as mesh local variables, so that for C in cells loop will prioritize those two attributes into shared memory first. Again, to summarize this section,、um, in this section we went over some compiler hints to further optimize cache utilization to be more specific, block local for dense nodes, and、uh, mesh local for mesh attributes. Um, but also,、um, you might want to <coughs> know that on top of that, recent generations of NVIDIA's GPU cards have been closing the gap on the、uh, read-only access between the global memory and the shared memory. So currently, we found BLS and mesh local to be more effective for caching the destinations of the atomic operations to rule out some uh, um, atomic um, atomic overhead. 
as a rule of thumb, since those hints do not interfere with the, with your computation, it is also highly recommended to run benchmarks to decide whether to enable them or not. All right. So uh, again, this course is about data. So last but not least, we will also look at our data at another level of granularity. Let's talk something about quantized data types. All previous messages we get from this course is to focus on data locality and cache hit rate to improve the performance. All right. And for simplicity, we always assume that our primitive data types are uh, some common data types, such as 32-bit uh, integers or 64-bit floating points. We use these primitive data types to construct the compound types, like uh, vectors or matrices or structures, and uh, use those compound types as basic elements to form our multidimensional arrays that we call fields. But also, as we may know, the main memory on GPU or on some other mobile devices are really limited. Um, sometimes the reason why we cannot run some program on certain devices could be simply out of memory. So quantize the data types. Being different with all those previous parts of this course cares more about the memory consumption of a program. So it's on the leftmost side of this figure. Quantization itself. This concept is not new. It is widely used in signal processing to map an analog signal to a digital one. And in computer science, it usually represents the uh, mapping from a high precision data types to some low precision ones. And we can use this technique to trade off precision for memory consumption. In Tai Chi, we can define a primitive quantized data type as follow. It uses ti.types.quant uh, to define an integer with certain bits. For example, this is a signed integer with five bits, uh, including the signed bits, or a fixed point, a fixed point number with uh, bits and range. For example, uh, fixed type A has 10 bits, um, and uh, the max value is 20, means that because it's a signed it is a signed data type, so it ranges from like 20 to 20, and uh, um, we can optimize the uh, the representation for each bit. It also can be used to define floating point numbers with explicitly specified exponent bits and fractional bits. For example, in this one, this uh, FP510 is a floating point type with five exponent bit and a ten um, fractional bit. The sign bit and um, if this is a sign one, um, the sign bit is included in the fractional bits. So let's take a look of a shockwave implementation in this example. One of the key components of the program is a 2D field, consists of n by n vectors, and each vector um, contains uh, four 32-bit floating point numbers, and uh, so that the size of the vector is 128 bits. So one question is, can we shrink every vector inside this field by half? So we can also reduce the size of the entire field by half, all right? Sure, we can. So if we reduce each floating point number to 16-bit, we can do this. We can compress the outcome vector um, to, to 64 bits and also reduce the number of the entire field, right? So uh, now let's uh, let's create a new quantized type. Let's call it the FP88. It has eight exponential exponent bit and eight fractional bit. But now the problem is that although we reduced uh, each floating point to 16 bit, the Tai Chi field as a container may still want to store those array using four bytes per data, so it will waste half of the space as shown in the middle. Ideally, we want those data primitives to be packed tighter, um, so as shown in the bottom. So in that case, we can use ti dot bit packed field um, to to solve this one. The bit packed field packs multiple quantized primitives into one node. For example, in in this one, in this example, it defines a vector field Q um, that composed by four quantized uh, floating points A8, FP A8, and defines another bit packed field with uh, 64 bits as its maximum number of bits. 
Once we place a Q field to the bit packed field, it will be packed into a, a tight field within 64 bits. Once we change the definition of the field, uh, we do not need to change the rest of the code. Again, we can just have our finger crossed and hope for the best. The result looks like uh, expected. It looks as bad as expected, right? Uh, the reason it looks bad is because we reduce the number of bits from FP32 uh, to this uh, quantized data, and it is too much. And because uh, during this, this quantization, we cut the fraction bit from 24 bits to only 8 bits. That's too much. That's too much. One way to handle it is to adjust the exponent, exponent bit and the fraction bits at the same time, uh, but sometimes we can do even better. One observation is that uh, um, for in many cases, at least in this simulation, the four numbers inside a vector are very likely to share similar exponents. So in this case, we can also pack the Q field into a bit packed field uh, with shared exponent. We can set this uh, shared exponent keyword in equals to true. And this will change the uh, the memory layout from the top one to the bottom one, right? This will increase the number of fraction bit uh, for each primitive from 8 bits to 14 bits, which is a lot. Now we can have a better looking simulation with only half of the memory consumption for field Q. And now the full precision one the full precision simulation on the left and the quantized simulation on the right looks pretty much similar. And by using this quantized data type and uh, bit packed field, uh, we can run an NPM simulation with a billion particles on a single GPU uh, with an 80 gig memory. Since the video is too large, we can then check it in the Tai Chi element repo. Uh, we can search for Tai Chi element. And uh, this repo should show us that demo. There we go. Okay, so this demo uh, not only uses uh, the sparse data structure, but also uses uh, quantized data types to save memory. Okay, to summarize this section, quantization here is a technique to trade off precision for less memory consumption. It allows us to run higher resolution simulations on devices with limited memory. And Tai Chi provides a way to define quantized data types and construct a tightly packed quantized field to reduce the memory consumption. The technical details of this quantization scheme and the design decisions and trade-offs were described in the Quantaichi paper last year in SIGGRAPH 2021. And this year, uh, Jia Feng Liu and uh, colleagues further extended the work to an automatic uh, quantization method, and the method was reported at SIGGRAPH this year. The examples we showed previously can be played um, in the Quantaichi repo, as long as you have Tai Chi installed on a computer, for sure. And this is a Quantaichi repo. Um, as we can see, it includes um, something like a game of life and uh, an MLS and PM simulation and uh, some uh, stable fluid simulation, like shown in the bottom. Phew. Okay. Uh, what a long journey today. So. I uh, guess we are almost done. The most important information of this course has been mentioned uh, ever from the beginning. The data matters a lot. Cache matters a lot. All right. And uh, then we briefly cover the Tai Chi programming language and to cover the way to change memory layout and to construct sparse data structures using the snow system of Tai Chi. And uh, um, this section tells us how to weave those efficient data layouts to maximize the cache utilization. And we also went over the way we accelerate unstructured mesh-based operations and in mesh Tai Chi. And here we introduced a new mesh 4, which parallelized the mesh-based opera operations in patches. And uh, uh, we also provide the reorder option and uh, provide the cache option without, the ch without changing the computation. 
Um, and also, we quickly went through some compiler hints, such as the block local and the mesh local one, to further accelerate a Tai Chi program. And finally, we mentioned the way to use quantize the data types um, as a side dish, like a buy one, get one free. Uh, and uh, this quantize the data types and uh, data arrays um, can help us a lot to save our memory. And let's call it a day. We hope this course can help you to set up a basic idea of high-performance programming in modern hardware where data access really matters a lot. And we hope this Tai Chi programming language can provide a simpler way for you and for me to um, play with different memory layouts and orderings to maximize the performance. And thank you for attending this course. If you find Tai Chi language interesting, you can also visit our website and uh, GitHub and also follow us on Twitter. Thank you.